Hi, welcome back to OneClimate.net at Copenhagen, the greatest show on earth. Uh, now we've got Amy Goodman, if you can hear me above the... Uh, yet another demonstration going on, another... Can't quite see what it is, but... Anyway, let's concentrate on Amy Goodman, US broadcast journalist, extraordinary syndicated columnist and author. I think she's going to wave her book around in a minute. I can't do that because I never get it on screen. Uh, host of Democracy Now!, which I'll ask you about what it is. Uh, and Climate Countdown. Well, let me just ask you what you're doing here first. That's the well, we've got this exclusive broadcast going here every day from, well, you might say the Bella of the Beast. Uh, right here inside the Bella Center. And we're doing a daily grassroots global news hour on radio, television, and the internet. Democracy Now! airs on 800 public radio and television stations. And we're here doing Climate Countdown. Uh, it's remarkable that you would have this gathering of tens of thousands of people. I mean, inside is something like 20,000 people, adding, counting the journalists too, that they can't all fit at one time. But last night in the rain, we took a kind of underground tour of the convergence spaces and the protest um, centers, the um, kitchens of the people who've come from not only around Denmark, not only around Europe, but from all over the world who will be taking to the streets because they are deeply concerned about climate change. Um, we're talking thousands of young people. But What's different about, for example, 10 years ago, the Battle of Seattle, which was truly groundbreaking and uh, shattered many paradigms about what is possible, is that here people are outside, but also inside. I mean, they're playing two roles. You've got all of the, the youngos, the engos, the bingos. I, I mean, I'm just learning these terms, right? The young NGOs, the business and industry NGOs, the engos, the environment NGOs. Um, uh, and you've got a lot of people who are inside, who are walking around. The question is, what exactly is going on here? Who has the power? And I think that came out uh, in this leak of secret documents called the Danish text recently, which was for all that everyone is doing here and their grave concerns about the fate of the planet, but also brilliant solutions about what can happen. Oh, Denmark and the US and Britain made a deal. And um, it somehow will get translated into supposedly the multilateral deal um, that should come out of this conference. That was the, the powers that be idea. But there was such an outcry um, led by, oh, the group of 77 in China, though China, it turns out now, and India were involved in this deal, where it was about maintaining the status quo. The major polluters, um, continuing to pollute at an incredibly high level, but the developing world um, uh, continuing to be disempowered. And that's one of the big discussions that's been going on here. Okay, now the trouble with talking to an experienced broadcaster, far more experienced than I am, that she's already answered all my questions, but I'll try and think of some more now. Um, so what have been your impressions of the coverage? You're presumably monitoring or having a, finding a few moments to look at the coverage. What, either from the US or from if you're just looking generally at uh, coverage? Well, being here in Copenhagen, I can't see all the US coverage, though uh, I could only guess how little there is. You know, the occasional, uh, occasional feature story, perhaps, in the mainstream media in the United States. But I don't think that represents most people's concerns. I mean, think about the corporate media in the United States. Who brings it to us? ExxonMobil and Chevron, the coal companies, the oil industry, the gas companies. I mean, in the same way that the weapons manufacturers do their advertising and they're covering the war, that's the very sad, limited bias coverage of war. In the same way when it comes to climate change, these very companies that are pouring millions into the networks to advertise are pouring millions into Congress every single week to prevent anything from changing. And in the mainstream media, you rarely have a serious discussion about what is happening, the seriousness of global warming, and then what has to be done. And I think the biggest issue to come out of here, to, to come out of COP15, is this whole idea that is coalescing and it's coming from the South of reparations, of climate debt. 
the idea that here these countries have been suffering terribly. We were just interviewing an Ecuadorian activist uh, whose idea, you know, keep the oil in the soil, uh, keep the tar sands in the land, uh, keep the coal in the hole, um, has really caught on. Now the president of Ecuador, Correa, has taken this issue on and saying, then you have to pay us to keep the oil in the soil. Um, they, these countries, the small island countries, African nations, are suffering terribly from what we have done in the Western world. So this isn't about as the U.S. climate uh, negotiators, uh, like Jonathan Pershing, have said, you know, there's only so much largesse that we have. This isn't about charity. This is about a serious debt. And what are we going to do about it? But uh, what I know uh, two or three years ago, definitely the, the debt idea was very strong. Now I think industrialized countries seem to be shifting away from that as rapidly as they can to say, point to the future, well, it's China, India, it's not us in the past. And that's why it seems at this conference they're trying to well, possibly make a new agreement or a new ish agreement. Right. Well, there's two things. First of all, Kyoto doesn't sunset in 2012. That's what the industrialized countries, particularly the United States, would like us to believe, that something new has to happen because if it doesn't happen, then we will have no agreement. No, that agreement continues. The U.S., sadly, under even President Obama, has not signed on to it. And um, there are goals there. And the question is, will there be a multilateral agreement that comes out of this? Uh, not the way the World Trade Organization works and other international financial institutions that gives you know much more weight to the industrialized countries, but all together figuring out how are we going to solve the problem that will take us down together. By the way, when you ask the question about media coverage in the United States, I think of something revolutionary that could happen. Most people tune into the media, radio and television to get the weather. It's as simple as that. They want to know what's happening today. Is it raining? Is it snowing? Is it hot? Is it cold? Imagine if these weather people, these forecasters, uh, when they're talking about droughts or fires or hurricanes, instead of flashing extreme weather, flashed global warming as a cause, because otherwise it all seems disparate. How could you say global warming? There's a fire here, but it's freezing in Portland, Oregon. So that can't be global warming. Oh, but it is. And it should be the meteorologist that everyone tunes into that is talking about this. Okay, that's a very nice idea. I, I can see why you're not director of uh, <laughs> CBC, but uh, uh, Jeffrey Allen, my colleague, is monitoring cyberspace, electronic world out there. What have you got, Jeff? Yeah, we've got people putting in comments on oneclimate.net and on Justin TV, and actually both have mentioned similar things. Uh, one, one person says um, in his country, actually didn't say where he's from, uh, five-year-olds know un have certain knowledge about climate change that you see interviews with Americans on the street and they don't know. Uh, and then uh, someone in London just said, Amy's right, Copenhagen is the, three or fourth, the third or fourth item on the news here in the UK, but how do you think we can circumvent the mainstream media? Well, that's what you and we are all about. And that's what is so important. That is the hope. I mean, as I was saying, Democracy Now! broadcasts in over 800 public radio and television stations and online to millions of people around the world, just walking through the streets of Copenhagen, uh, meeting people from Britain, from Hong Kong, from Sweden. They watch or listen to Democracy Now! And it's not just Democracy Now! It's your broadcast today online. It's all the independent media. In fact, as we speak right now, there's an indie media convergence taking place in Denmark, right here in Copenhagen, as people plan. It really came out of 10 years ago, the Battle of Seattle. How would that be covered? The corporate networks weren't even going to Seattle to cover the protests against the World Trade Organization. It was Democracy Now!, it was indie media that were saying, look, they're shooting rubber bullets, we're picking up by the handfuls. And CNN was saying, no, the chief of police says we're not doing that. Well, of course, in fact, it was true. And interestingly enough, the chief of police today from the Battle of Seattle has completely changed his tune and said it was a complete disaster what we did and how we held down the protests when it was these people who had the ideas. The only thing dangerous about what they were doing was that they were challenging the status quo that needed to be challenged.
indie media is where it's at. Not brought to you by the corporations that profit uh, from the status quo, from the global warming, from war, from the economic meltdown, but brought to us independently because people are deeply concerned about the state of the planet and want to reflect what is happening so we can do something about it.